Hello and welcome to Physical Attraction. Today as a break from our regularly programmed series we are going to be talking about a couple of new developments in the world of science and technology. So this is really a thermonuclear takes episode where we deal with some topics that have been in the news lately. I talk about them, give my perspective. and uh... So the first story we're going to talk about is Dr. Alexa. This idea of whether we're actually going to have healthcare assistants that are voice agents enabled by big, these big corporations. And um, you can see why the big tech companies want to get into this, because it's hard to imagine a field where data is more valuable than in healthcare. Monitoring and interpreting these crucial health indices is the difference between an early diagnosis and a late one, and that can even be the difference between life and death. And if you're telling someone, especially an affluent rich person, that you can give them a 10 to 20% chance of better uh, being diagnosed with an illness or keeping track of their health through various different uh, data streams that are being monitored and so on. I think they'll probably take you up on that chance. So neural networks and machine learning algorithms are getting better at interpreting these signals, monitoring data and uh, finding patterns in health data and even diagnosing certain illnesses in some cases. Particularly for radiographers, you can now show lots of neural networks and algorithms a scan and they can detect whether a tumour is cancerous or not with better skill than many of the best radiographers out there. So there's this clear drive towards creating a fully integrated medical assistant, one that can chat with you about your health while simultaneously using data from any wearable devices, blood sugar measurements, and possibly more complicated tests to diagnose any conditions. And you can actually see how this works quite well. If you've ever rung up, if you're living in the UK, which I know some of my listeners are, not all of you, um, if you've ever rung up NHS 111, uh, which is the National Health Service uh, sort of non-emergency talk about your problems with someone in real time type thing. If you do that, they have a specific quiz that they take you through where you describe your condition and they'll either make an on-the-spot diagnosis or they'll tell you, you know, it's probably a cold, you're just fine. Or they'll say, we think it's a good idea for you to come in on such and such a timescale. These recommendations could probably be done quite easily by a sufficiently well-trained conversational algorithm that could take you through the same quiz and gather the same information and analyse it in a more efficient way. So in an ideal world, if you had this set up, it would flag any potential problems early on and then it would let the patients get better care. When they see the doctor, the healthcare staff know they have a much more uh, rich access to a better record of the recent medical history of the patient and then they can assess what the best course of treatment is going to be. And then once the treatment's ongoing, again in this ideal world where all of this works, the medical assistant could provide a way of monitoring the progress, analysing the effectiveness of the treatment, and updating the hospital. So if you were to properly anonymise all this stuff, you can actually see that it would improve healthcare quite vastly, because you'd have so much additional data which would allow medical professionals to improve treatments, give patients better information, and you know, generally evidence-based medicine is the type of thing that we're looking at here. Um, the result then in this optimistic vision of the future is better, more efficient healthcare for patients. But of course, healthcare is also an industry, especially in the United States, and it can be a really, really profitable industry. And there's always going to be a tension at these blurry borderlines between data collection for the purpose of improving a service and surveillance capitalism. After all, this is what Facebook and Google and so on always tell you when they talk about collecting and processing your data. They say, oh, we're going to make this service better for you because you're going to see adverts that are targeted to you that will be more relevant and more interesting and things that you're more interested in seeing, that sort of thing. And, you know, they'll say, oh, we need to collect data about our users because understanding the user experience is how we have such a good product, all that kind of thing. But of course, it's not just about how, making sure the user has a better experience, or if it is, making sure the user has a better experience is there so that you can make more money. So a recent example of this is Amazon's announcement that its Alexa voice assistant and associated devices can now handle customers' healthcare data in the US. So specifically, there are some laws that govern this, and the data handling protocols for Alexa are now compliant with regulations under the US Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which is called HIPAA. And this sets the standards for storage, transmission, and use of sensitive healthcare data for patients. Amazon have also announced partnerships with six other HIPAA-compliant companies, which are building Alexa apps or skills, allowing Alexa owners to check the status of shipments for prescription medications or book emergency appointments with certain healthcare providers. So, you know, this might seem like a small step. Okay, now you can book an appointment over Alexa. That's not really a surprise. Is it really that different to booking appointments over a phone or another app? But it's obviously this is all part of a long-term trend and a long-term strategy by Amazon to move into the healthcare industry. 
One of the things that they're hoping to do is for customers to monitor and analyse their blood sugar results via Alexa, communicating with wireless glucose monitors. And Amazon sees a profitable niche in helping patients with diabetes manage their condition. And of course, it's even more profitable if you can also sell them the insulin. It's a global market that's estimated to run into the billions of dollars all by itself. So last year, Amazon bought PillPack, which is an online pharmacy company that ships medications directly to users. And that's a billion dollar purchase when they bought PillPack. So obviously, this is a considerable wing of where they're hoping to go with their company. And they're obviously aiming to do to pharmacy what's already been done to ordinary shops and bookshops and electronics outlets by Amazon. So a while ago, some reporters found a sign-up page for PillPack on Amazon's websites, which shows that they're ready to roll this out pretty soon. And it seems inevitable that this will be integrated with the new Alexa skills and their data management to encourage customers to buy their pharmaceutical companies via an Amazon-owned company. So one of the other ways that people try and look into how companies like Amazon are doing, particularly when they're not announcing these things especially uh, loudly, they look at the hires, and last year it was reported that Amazon's healthcare and wellness group had made lots of hires from other healthcare companies and was seeking to make their device hyper-compliant. Meanwhile, they already have most of the delivery infrastructure in place to supply medicines to individuals and hospitals, so really it's just for them getting around the licensing. And now, Amazon can use Alexa to legally share healthcare data with medical professionals, patients, and indeed all these third-party apps that it's forming these partnerships with. So you can imagine that this will provide benefits to consumers for less serious conditions. You could imagine the entire process from diagnosis and testing to medication to monitoring and follow-up being done entirely via Alexa and Amazon's delivery services. So, of course, it would be more convenient if you could do all of this without visiting your doctor and it would uh, reduce the strain on the healthcare service. But, of course, this does come with trade-offs. One potential customer for Amazon's healthcare databases will be insurance companies who want to fill in incomplete databases so that they can more accurately price their products to individuals. And of course, all of that is making sure that health insurance for people who really need it is more expensive and the profit margins for the industry in the States is, is much, much higher. Now, the other thing to think about is just the consequences of having these streams of data, very, very personal data about your healthcare. Uh, flowing through companies like Amazon. This is a world where Facebook knows that you're pregnant before you do. And you can imagine the price of your health insurance could be dictated by a black box neural network score that's analysing endless streams of data, what you eat, but also what you buy, what you search for online. Adding Alexa or connected healthcare diagnostic devices could just as easily allow your insurance company to know you're sick perhaps before you even do and change their prices accordingly. Given that Amazon has patented a skill that allows Alexa to pick up on coughs and potentially to even analyse these coughs to distinguish between the flu and something more serious, you can expect to be swamped with adverts for cough drops and cold medicine if you ever happen to sniffle next to your Echo device. Perhaps more personal and more worrying is that similar software will be used to analyse your emotional state. This was considered as part of the diabetes management plan back in 2017 that Amazon were looking at. Living with a condition can be stressful, and that stress in turn can affect your blood sugar levels. So you can see that there's an integrated system that monitors your blood sugar, reminds you to check your insulin, calculates the appropriate dose, orders more, lets you work out these things based on what you're eating and so on. This would be good for patients, although such systems do already exist. Uh, my brother uses one and they're widely used already without passing data to Amazon. But if that same device starts analysing your mood via your voice and blood sugar, and uses that to target advertising or build up a profile of you that is then sold to other companies, it becomes a gross invasion of privacy under the guise of providing better care. And the scary thing here is that if the algorithms that are making these decisions about healthcare, ultimately about who gets the treatment, who gets to live and die, and who pays for it, if, if these algorithms are impenetrable black boxes that seek to optimise profits for private companies, uh, maybe as well as or instead of the healthcare outcomes for individuals, the, the utopia that this these streams of data can enable us to make better and better healthcare for people looks very different. So it's all this question of who is going to control and benefit from the... Uh, ability that we have now to collect all of this data, analyse it, process it, and 
automatically almost learn more about how the world works and how people work in the world. So in, in the digital economy, we all face daily choices and daily trade-offs of this kind, where we're basically asked to sacrifice our privacy for convenience. But often, though, we're not really given a choice. A necessary condition of using a service is that it collects data on you and builds up one of countless profiles of you that exist in databases around the world. For example, Facebook, even if you don't use Facebook, it will still track you as you go through the internet. It will still build up an advertiser's profile for you. There's no way to avoid this because these things are so deeply embedded into the infrastructure that's being built. So you can imagine that if the healthcare system becomes just another area where the sacrificing of privacy in exchange for using a service is built into it, this could be very bad for customers and people in the future. Now, of course, this is a story about how Amazon are hyper-compliant now, and hyper does theoretically give patients the right to access the healthcare data that's stored about them, and they should also be able to limit access to that data. But for my US listeners now, how many of you know that this is the case? And how many of you would know how to actually start doing that with your own data? I mean, it's a start, but it still feels that individuals are deliberately kept in the dark about algorithmic influences on our lives, increasingly facing decisions that are being made by processes that are intentionally obscure, using data they had no idea was being collected or analysed in this way, and then making decisions that can't be queried or reversed. Maybe no one even understands why it is that the algorithm is recommending a certain kind of treatment to one person, or recommending a certain kind of insurance price to another person. And if it's all done by the machine, and we are allowing our machines not to be questioned or uh, judged on moral grounds, if you see what I mean, then some pretty bad things can happen, as we've seen with uh, technology inequality and catastrophic risks in the past. There are many things that we would like the future of healthcare to be, but Kafkaesque is not really one of them. So the balance between the many potential benefits of big data analysis in healthcare and the potential for exploitation and privacy violations surrounding that data, I think it's going to be a hotly debated topic for years to come. And I think it's going to be interesting to watch as Google and Amazon and Facebook and other large tech companies and tech startups that are essentially having a business model that is built on let's create streams of data and sort of mine them for profit, how they approach the healthcare industry uh, as things develop. So the other topic I wanted to talk to you about is another story of massive tech companies trying to uh, influence a new area, a new market they haven't necessarily got into before. And this is all prompted by the talk recently about Elon Musk and his fleet of satellites, Starlink. So this article was published on Singularity Hub as Starlink and the Global Internet Race. And it starts with a quote from a song by Billy Bragg, which I'm not going to sing to you. So you have been spared. You know, you can't say that I don't treat you right, because otherwise, under normal circumstances, I'd sing this from a New England, but not today. So he said, I saw two shooting stars last night. I wished on them, but they were only satellites. It's wrong to wish on space hardware. So there's a whole mini constellation of new satellites in the sky recently. SpaceX has launched the first wave of its planned Starlink fleet of satellites into low Earth orbit. The 60 satellites, they weigh 13.6 tonnes in total, were deposited 400 kilometres above the Earth's surface by a Falcon 9 rocket, and they've joined two early experimental Starlink satellites that were launched in 2018, and they've come into an increasingly crowded region of space. The aim of the project is often stated as providing internet to the next 4 billion users, which represents a massive potential marketplace, and of course a considerable revenue stream for SpaceX. Yet alongside these extra 4 billion people who various companies are trying to now get online and provide internet to, you can also imagine that some lucrative specialist services might be possible as well. So a lot of things are going to depend on how the system actually operates in practice. But light travels faster through the vacuum of space than through fibre optic cables. So it's feasible that the satellites could provide faster links between cities. Now, the financial services industry and high frequency traders in particular have previously bored cable through mountains to shave milliseconds off transaction times, creating a cable as close to straight as possible to reduce the lag in their communication speed. Doing that actually earned them billions when they did this in the first place. So it could be a very lucrative service indeed when Starlink is complete. 
Now, Starlink is unlikely to be able to compete with the highest of high-frequency traders who physically locate themselves next to exchanges, but the increased speed of intercontinental data transfer is probably going to allow them to charge a hefty rent to anyone who is going to want to use this super-duper high-speed internet. The 500 satellites that are currently in low Earth orbit, though, uh, of all kinds this is in low Earth orbit, could ultimately be dwarfed by the Starlink. So when it's complete, it could consist of 12,000 satellites in total. And the reason for this is because the satellites are in such low Earth orbit, they can actually only cover a fairly small part of Earth at any one time. Which means that you need to have many, many of them uh, constantly orbiting around to give you a constant signal. And this has been the problem with providing satellite internet in the past, um, how you get over this intermittency and latency and so on. Now, you're thinking probably, if we have only 500 satellites there now, and 12,000 from Starlink are launched, then what happens when these satellites die? We know that there's a big problem with space junk. Uh, debris in space doesn't just, you know, blow away. There's no wind up there. Instead, it stays in orbit for years and years and years. So when a satellite is shot down, or when a satellite crashes, or when a satellite is no longer useful, you actually have large amounts of junk flying around in space. And because it's in low Earth orbit, because it's orbiting the Earth at a considerable speed, orbital velocity is you know, order kilometers a second. Even little chips of paint can smash into satellites and destroy them. So how is this not going to contribute to space junk? Well, the satellites are supposedly going to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere after five years of use, providing that they can avoid uh, unintentional collisions. And according to SpaceX and the people who are launching these satellites, they say that if they burn up every five years, they can also replace them with newer models and upgrade them and so on. Um, but 12,000 might not be the upper limit to the number of satellites that might be launched to do this kind of thing, because SpaceX is really not the only company that's looking into this. There's loads of companies that are trying to reap the potentially vast rewards from selling internet access to the next few billion users. And when you see how fierce this race is, and look at the competitors involved, you can see why Elon Musk is in a rush to get his satellites up there. So Amazon, uh, they have a similar project that they've called Project Kuiper, which is named after the Kuiper belt of uh, asteroids and so on in our own solar system. Now that exists mainly on paper, they haven't decided whether to buy third-party satellites or build their own, but they're hoping to launch more than 3,000 internet providing satellites in the coming decades. Facebook has their own internet satellite called Athena. Uh, this was noticed when it was quietly licensed by the FCCC through a subsidiary company called Point View Tech LLC. Uh, again, these companies are all operating in stealth because they want to not give away any trade secrets. You know, they're all racing with each other. So this is clearly something that they're all extremely keen on. Now, they claim that they'll use millimeter wave radio signals to provide speeds of up to 10 gigabytes per second, which would be 10 times faster than those that Starlink can do. However, these millimeter wave radio signals suffer from their own problems because this high frequency radiation can be absorbed by raindrops or aerosols in the atmosphere. So a large part of what Athena is doing at first is to try and determine whether these problems are insurmountable and how they might be addressed. Yet ultimately, no matter how they do it, they're still going to need thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit. This isn't even Facebook's first attempt to provide a more global internet coverage with new technology. It had a project called Aquila, which was going to use solar-powered drones flying high in the stratosphere to provide internet access to the surface below. That's been sidelined recently because one of the drones crashed during a test flight. Um, although Facebook has recently started testing drones built by Airbus and even fired, filed a patent for a drone that is going to stay aloft using kites, which is very strange. Meanwhile, Google is famously engaging in this thing, Project Loon, where they're hoping to deliver internet access by stratospheric balloons. It's probably the most well-developed of these next-generation internet projects, although they have also tested solar-powered drones. Um, in 2011, they first started talking about this, and now Project Loon has completed its prototype, its testing phases, and they're saying that they're going to try and make the first sales of internet provided in this way by partnering with telecoms companies in Kenya and so on to provide internet access, alongside selling some of the software that they use to control the moving network of balloons to its competitors. This includes a recently announced collaboration with SoftBank. Um, for those who don't know, SoftBank is a huge uh, Japanese telecommunications company. Uh, they're famously forward-looking when it comes to investment, and they own you know, several robotics companies that I'm sure we'll talk about in future times. And they also have this SoftBank Vision Fund, which is a sort of collaboration with Saudis and oil money and so on. And they have hundreds of billions that they're investing in kind of out there startup projects and so on. 
Um, SoftBank are developing their own solar-powered drone to provide internet access, and Google are working with them as well. So broadly speaking, when you're thinking about which of these technologies is more feasible, the satellite-based projects will face these steeper initial costs to do with launching stuff into space, and they'll require longer to deploy because you'll have to deploy these satellites in phases. Um, but they might hope to provide more consistent global coverage with longer lifetimes. Uh, when you compare to the solar-powered drones or the stratospheric balloons, they will cover smaller regions and have shorter lifetimes. Um, Google's balloons, for example, stay aloft for around half a year at a time. Facebook's drones were hoping to fly for three months, although that depends on battery life and the solar recharging improving. Um, but while these are providing coverage to a smaller area, they can be deployed more cheaply and flexibly. So you can imagine that you might fly these over a town or a city or a particular area where people uh, want Wi-Fi, uh, where they want internet. Um, but it remains to be seen which of these business models will prove the more profitable. So when it comes to assessing the impact of this technology then, the benefits of internet access are undeniable. I mean, the internet has been a really great leveller. It provides access to nearly boundless information, the ability to instantaneously communicate with others. I mean, it really, you struggle to think of anything since the printing press that has led to this information revolution and societal reorganisation in, in the world. And we really haven't seen the full impact of what the internet is going to do to us and our society. We see it unfold in various ways all the time, but it's by no means shaken out. There's a really, really great quote I like about the French Revolution, um, where I think a historian a few years ago was asked, you know, uh, what, how would you assess the French Revolution? Do you think it was uh, a good thing, a bad thing for society? And he basically just said, well, it's too early to say now, isn't it? And I feel the same way about the internet. I think we're going to really spend an awfully long time trying to work out precisely uh, the impacts of the internet on our society. And uh, there, there's lots of things going on at the moment that still haven't fully uh, taken into account the way that this has changed, if you see what I mean. But for some, for, for such a huge part of so many of our lives in the West, and presumably yours if you're listening to this show, the fact that billions have patchy access or no access at all is one of the horrible injustices in our global society. And it's not just about people looking at cat memes or listening to podcasts or whatever. Lives can be saved by having this communications network. Economic, social advances, ideas can be spread. It's all very important. But of course, despite what Facebook and Google's PR will say, these big tech companies are not engaged in this business purely out of the kindness of their hearts, you know? Controlling the flow of information to the next few billion people means power and profits. And this goes beyond simply selling people internet access. So in this world of surveillance capitalism in which we live, every stream of data on every individual is digital gold, enabling behaviours to be influenced and advertising to be sold. Facebook had this project a few years ago, internet.org, uh, and that was an initial sort of clumsy attempt at reaping this harvest. So they provided a limited internet access that collected users' data while directing them to Facebook's own website, driving up its traffic and profits, and a small selection of other companies that paid for the privilege. So it wasn't really that popular. People were kind of annoyed that this thing was filled with ads, that it was tracking them, that it was learning all their data, that it was only allowing them on a certain number of websites. I mean, one thing that you'll find really annoying was that it allowed you to search for things but not to click on any of the links to the search imagine having access to google but you can't click on any of the links once you've googled stuff you just see all the titles of the pages come up so obviously this is less about connecting the world and improving people's lives it's more about increasing facebook's traffic and its profit margins and when people described it as digital colonialism i don't think it was really that far off so because this was so irritating for people it ended up being banned in india and it was under fire elsewhere and it's been increasingly sidelined. So they're trying again with a more sort of softly, softly, slightly more subtle approach, I suppose. And of course, then you have to consider alongside what the companies are doing this for and what they're going to do with it by controlling the infrastructure for the internet for the majority of the world's population. The sheer scale of the infrastructure for these projects has also caused a great deal of concern. For example, when uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX first started talking about doing Starlink, someone thought... Well, if all of these satellites are going to break up and burn up in the atmosphere and come down and crash into Earth, will any of them hit anything? And it turns out that by the estimate that was made by, I think, IE Spectrum, there was a 45% chance that one of these 12,000 satellites would actually kill or injure someone, uh, not to mention any property damage that might be caused. 
Um, SpaceX has recently responded to this, and they now claim that they've redesigned the satellite so that no components large enough to cause injury will survive re-entry. But, you know, the fact that companies that are essentially saying, well, we can launch 12,000 satellites into space, there's absolutely no restrictions on us doing this, we don't even have to calculate whether it's going to hit anyone in advance. I mean, it does make you wonder, space so far has been a little bit like Antarctica in the sense that it's fairly well preserved as a region that we haven't had too much intervention in, but... As we look to exploit it more and more and more, and people are more and more interested in what you can do with it, it's going to become a, a bit of a battleground for different corporations and different interests. And uh, it's certainly very interesting to see how this final frontier is being treated by these companies. Um, and this is no more obvious in what happened when these Starlink satellites launched, because as some excited observers saw them, others were raising questions. Because... They could see these satellites in the sky. So according to one astronomer's calculations, up to 500 satellites could be visible from the ground at any one time. And that would outnumber the visible stars in the sky for most people. So if Starlink and its competitors all succeed in launching their own new constellations, they may well drown out the constellations that we're all familiar with. Humanity has already left its mark on Earth with accelerating destruction of the biosphere, influence over land and ocean, everything, everywhere, there's waste, there's plastics, there's dead species, there's, we've left a horrible sort of fingerprint on the earth that I don't think is ever going to fade away or will take millions of years to do so. And our fingerprints on space are growing in number as well. Now, most astronomy is based on the ground. That's still the majority of astronomy. It's expensive and difficult to maintain space telescopes. And astronomers already have to edit out loads of trajectories of satellites from their photos. So, there's going to be a lot of impacts for astronomers when they have to deal with this vast set of new satellites that are very bright, uh, reflecting sunlight and disturbing their instruments. But alongside these practical considerations, it's hard to comprehend the psychological impact that this would have. The night sky has been a source of fascination for humanity since we first evolved. When we discovered how far away the stars were, and what they were made of, and that they made us in their collisions and in supernovae, that, uh, that picture of the night sky took on all the more meaning. And this may now be changed forever without anyone's consent. These stars, they link us to the cosmos, to our origin, to our dreams of a destination, to our place in the universe, to something beyond ourselves. So is that night sky a fair price to pay for progress, and will we get any say in that decision? Even as the internet provides a wonderful, revolutionary and low-cost source of information, communications infrastructure that could potentially benefit billions, it can also be a source of misinformation and rumour. Tech companies who profit from harvesting user data and selling advertising, they want to become the gatekeepers for the next few billion users in a new digital gold rush. And a big part of that is going to be about how they can influence and shape those societies, and you better believe it will be in ways that are good for the shareholders of those companies. As this race unfolds, exciting as it may be to watch and fascinating as it may be to see all of the different companies and all the different technology that they're going to use, it's hard not to feel a little bit of unease, because the internet has really started as this quite libertarian, quite strange, quite rare thing, in, 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 the, in the genuine sense of the word, not the sort of modern political sense of the word, but there was a sort of freedom of information, there was a freedom of uh, communicating with people from all over the world, and there was a, a certain levelling too, because your Twitter handle is the same as everyone else's Twitter handle, save for one or two blue ticks here or there. You know, you can have a website, and if it's a good website, people will visit it regardless of who you are. It, it's made, it's taken away a lot of power from traditional gatekeepers and traditional publishers and allowed lots of people to do their own thing. But, um, but you have to question whether this freedom is going to be increasingly restricted by companies as they seek to turn the internet into a big profit-driven machine. And uh, will the internet for the next few billion users look anything like the internet that we've known? And who's going to benefit the most when it is expanded? So that's a couple of just news stories lately that are really talking about the ways in which large tech companies are expanding into new markets and new areas and the reasons behind them doing what they're doing. And I think it's, it's really fascinating whenever you read a headline, uh, particularly in sort of journalism, technology journalism and... Uh, and science-based things and you, there's some brand new development that one of these companies is taking in some area they're looking to expand into you always have to think why are they doing this uh where is the profit for them and what does society look like when 
one company or a, f- a small number of tech companies has control over this aspect of things as well as everything else. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed my sort of musings on these two stories. Uh, you can find the articles which contain plenty of links to other articles up on Singularity Hub. Uh, this has been a Thermonuclear Takes episode of Physical Attraction. You can find the show on www.physicspodcast.com where you'll also find the contact form. So if you have any comments, questions, concerns, things you'd like to tell me about, new ideas for episodes, thoughts on what we've discussed, uh, that would be great to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Twitter is Physics Pod and Facebook is Physical Attraction. Uh, I respond to people who talk to me through there, so it's always good to get in touch via those means. Uh, on the website, you'll find the possibility to donate to the show. But if you don't fancy that, the best thing you can do is to tell as many of your interested and interesting friends to listen to the show as you can. Uh, every listener makes it more worthwhile for me to carry on doing this. Um, until next time, then, take care. Thank you.